Hello and welcome to my newest pathophysiology video. I am Scott Kruger, and today we're going to be talking about some neurological terms and disorders, and then we're going to get a little bit into some of our musculoskeletal disorders as well as some terms. One of the first terms that we want to be concerned with in our neurological system is the hypothalamus. So the hypothalamus is located uh, about midbrain, and the hypothalamus is important in controlling our body temperature. It's important in regulating our fluid balance, and the hypothalamus also plays an important part in when we feel hungry and when we feel full. Our second term we wanna talk about is the extra pyramidal system that helps controls and coordinates skeletal muscle activity, such as arm swinging when walking. Our next area is our prefrontal cortex. So that's our upper frontal part of our brain. And that part of our brain is concerned with higher level intellectual functioning. One of the areas that is concerned with speech is Broca's area, that's also in our brain. Wernicke's area has to do with comprehension of speech, and that area is also in our brain. So the difference between those two, they're both concerned with speech. Broca's is concerned with speaking, talking. Wernicke's area is concerned with being able to interpret, receive messages. Our next term concerns our choroid plexus. Choroid plexus in the brain, once again, that's what secretes our cerebrospinal fluid. And CSF is very important for providing nutrition uh, as well as protecting our brain and our spinal cord. Our next term here, we're gonna get a little bit into some diseases. Guillain-Barre, Guillain-Barre, that's an autoimmune condition that can come about sometimes after a viral infection. Uh, there have been cases where Guillain-Barre has come about after certain immunizations against certain viruses. Um, and that is where our immune system, our own immune system is attacking the myelin sheath surrounding our neurons in our peripheral nervous system. And that can lead to progressive muscle weakening that occurs in an ascending fashion. So it usually starts around the feet, works its way up the body. So that's Guillain-Barre. Multiple sclerosis is another autoimmune disorder and that affects the neurons in our central nervous system. So in our brain and our spinal cord. So Guillain-Barre and multiple sclerosis, very similar, both autoimmune disorders that attack the myelin sheath Guillain-Barre attacks the nerves in our peripheral nervous system, and then multiple sclerosis attacks the myelin sheath in the neurons in our central nervous system, in our brain and spinal cord. Our next disease is Parkinson's, and that's basically a progressive neurodegenerative disorder caused by a loss of dopamine, which is a neurotransmitter. So. Whenever you see that word dopamine, uh, we should uh, correlate that with Parkinson's. And so they have a loss of dopamine in Parkinson's. Dementia is a progressive chronic disease in which our cortical functioning is decreased that impairs our cognitive skills such as language, logical thinking and judgment, as well as our ability to learn new information and muscle coordination. Meningitis can be viral, bacterial, or fungal in its origin. Most of the time, it's usually bacterial. And meningitis affects the meninges in our CNS. There is a vaccine available. Signs and symptoms of meningitis include a positive Koenig and Brzezinski sign. That is where um, you bend your leg a certain way or try and straighten it out and it's very difficult to do because of those swollen meninges. It's gonna cause um, definitely some pain, um, possibly a headache. Nuchal rigidity is the term that we use when you, it's very difficult and painful to bring your chin to your chest. 
That's nuchal rigidity. Other signs and symptoms of meningitis include back pain and then photophobia, sensitivity to light. Our next term here that we wanna discuss is brain abscess. A brain abscess can come about from either a ear, throat, lung, or sinus infection, uh, and that includes the bacteria Staphylococcus, uh, as well as septic embo emboli, and that can frequently occur in our frontal or our temporal lobes of our brain. Our next term we want to talk about is encephalitis. That's usually viral in its origin, and it can be in the parenchymal or connective tissues in the brain and spinal cord, our central nervous system. Looking at Ray's syndrome, typically that is a viral infection in children and they were treated with aspirin. So one of the things that we definitely want to avoid treating a fever with in children is we don't want to use aspirin to treat pain or fever in children as it can lead to Ray's syndrome. All right, now we're gonna talk a little bit about stroke. So stroke is damage to the brain from an interruption in blood supply. Stroke is definitely a medical emergency. You wanna note the time that the patient started having signs and symptoms of a stroke uh, because this can dictate whether or not we're gonna do a specific treatment. And we'll talk about that in just a minute. We have several different types of stroke. We have our TIA, which is known as a mini stroke. We have an ischemic stroke, which is basically a blockage that has formed, um, uh, originated in your brain artery. We have an embolic stroke, which means we had a clot from elsewhere in our body travel to the brain. And then we have our hemorrhagic stroke, which is basically a brain bleed. Uh, many times that comes about from a aneurysm in the brain that has burst, or it's possible that you can have a hemorrhagic stroke from some kind of injury or trauma where you're now bleeding in your brain. Some of our predisposing risk factors for stroke include atherosclerosis, that's a buildup of plaque in the arteries, having high cholesterol, cholesterol over 200 total, uh, high blood pressure is a risk factor for stroke, smoking, having diabetes, and then birth control pills can definitely increase your risk for having a stroke. Signs and symptoms of stroke really depend on the obstruction location, basically where in your brain that this happened, the size of the artery involved, as well as the functional area of your brain that's affected. But we may see symptoms as the patient has trouble walking, speaking, understanding. Uh, they may also have paralysis of one side, numbness of the face, arm, or leg. We can use our stroke scale to evaluate our client's ability to speak. We can use it to evaluate their level of consciousness, motor abilities, and then eye movement. Early treatment of stroke, we can use medications like TPA, also known as our clot bust, buster, and that can minimize brain damage. However, we absolutely do not wanna use TPA for our hemorrhagic stroke. Hemorrhagic stroke typically has the poorest outcome of all the strokes. Other treatments focus on limiting complications due to the stroke and then preventing additional strokes with using medications like aspirin to thin the blood and statins to help reduce cholesterol. One thing to note is that when you have even just a mini stroke, like a TIA, that can increase further risk for having an additional bigger stroke. All right, looking at seizure. Seizure, also known as epilepsy, that is a sudden, uncontrolled electrical disturbance in the brain. We have a couple different types of seizures. We have absence seizure, which is commonly seen in children. 
and so, and the name absence uh, really kind of defines what this um, seizure looks like in that many times there may be no outward signs and symptoms that uh, children is having a stroke. So sometimes it may be that the child is just staring off into the distance. Sometimes they can do what's known as like lip smacking, uh, kind of like this uh, weird hand motion, like a pill rolling. Um, so with those absence seizures, sometimes it's a bit difficult uh, to diagnose those in children. We have what's known as a focal seizure, seizure, so that's just one area, specific area of the brain. And then we have our generalized seizures where both sides of the brain are being affected. Risk factors for seizure include family history, head injury, brain infection, stroke, dementia, and then alcohol dependence. Some terms that we wanna know about with seizure include tonic, and that is where the muscles become stiff, atonic, where the muscles in the body relax, myoclonic is this short jerking in parts of the body, and then clonic is our alternating contraction and relaxation. So that alternation between those two contraction and, and uh, relaxation. Treatment of seizures include anti-seizure medications, changes in diet, surgery, electrical stimulation, and definitely it's important, anybody who is seen having a seizure, uh, it's important that we make the area safe. So we want to remove any close dangers because obviously when you're seizing, you're shaking real fast, you're jerking, you could possibly hit your head or bump into something. So if we see anyone having a seizure, we just clear the area, maybe put a pillow under their head. It might help to sort of turn them on their side. Sometimes people with seizure can throw up, so we don't want them aspirating on their own vomit. So we can turn them to the side. You never wanna stick anything in their mouth. You obviously wanna call for help right away. Um, and then one more thing to associate with seizures is what's known as an aura. And sometimes that aura is almost like a sign that a seizure is about to come about. So some people with seizures describe their aura as like feeling like a warm sensation, uh, feeling like something just, just isn't right. It could be all of a sudden they get real sensitive to sound, temperature, touch things like that. So that aura is almost like a warning sign that a seizure is about to come out. Okay, now we're gonna get a little bit into our musculoskeletal terms and diseases. Our first musculoskeletal, <coughs> sorry, <clears throat> musculoskeletal term deals with dislocation. And that is basically a loss of contact between our articular cartilage. So. Obviously, dislocation has to deal with a joint. That joint is out of place. Carpal tunnel syndrome is compression of the medium, median nerve in the palm. And many times people get carpal tunnel from repetitive movement. So uh, treatments for that include wearing a brace, uh, may have to do some lifestyle modifications. Maybe you can't do that repetitive movement as much anymore. And then, um, surgery as well. Uh, knowing the difference between a sprain and a strain, a sprain is an injury to a ligament. A strain is an injury to a muscle or tendon. And one of the ways to remember that strain has the T in it, we associate that with tendon. Uh, we have a couple different fractures, bone fractures that we want to know about comminuted fracture, that is where our bone fragments into many, many pieces. A green stick fracture is an incomplete break along the length of the bone. A compression fracture is where our bone is crushed. An open fracture is where the bone protrudes through our skin. Uh, looking at a basilar skull fracture, 
that can be seen in domestic abuse cases or cases where someone had some kind of head injury. Uh, usually the injury is not visually evident or diagnosed by a CT scan. However, the client may have bruising or discoloration around the eye or a runny nose, and that can be due to leakage of blood or cerebral spinal fluid resulting from the fracture. So if you see like a clear fluid and someone has suffered some kind of head injury, it's important to, we can use what's known as like a glucose stick and test that clear drainage for the presence of glucose. And that can indicate that that is cerebral spinal fluid leaking out. And that can definitely be an issue because our cerebral spinal fluid are, um, is usually, that area is usually sterile. But now that we have an opening to it, it's very possible that some kind of infection can go in there. So we wanna act on that as soon as possible. Uh, two terms we wanna know about muscles, and that's actin and myosin. Actin is a protein produce, that produces thin contractile filaments within our muscle cells. Myosin is a protein that produces the dense contractile filaments within muscles. Actin and myosin together, they work together to generate muscle contractions and movement. All right, and lastly, we're gonna talk about osteoporosis. Osteoporosis is a condition in which our bones become weak and brittle. Risk factors include smoking, alcohol use, decreased calcium intake. Our women who are postmenopausal, uh, they're at risk for uh, developing osteoporosis due to the loss of the protective effects of estrogen. Obviously, the older you get in age, the more your risk for osteoporosis increases. Uh, Gender-wise, females tend to be more at risk for osteoporosis being of white or Asian ancestry, and then a thin build are all risk factors for the development of loss of your bone, osteoporosis. Treatment of osteoporosis includes calcium, increasing your calcium intake, and you can do that via your diet or supplements. Interventions include weight-bearing exercises like walking, yoga, tai chi, qigong, and then standing meditation. Very important that we prevent falls in osteoporosis because clients are more at risk of having a bone fracture uh, due to that weakening or brittle bones. Okay, that's all we have for you today for our neuro and musculoskeletal system. Thank you so much for joining me. We will see you again.